Hello, my name is Elizabeth Grace Goel. I'm a high school student in Massachusetts and founder of The Justly Project, an organization dedicated to using oral history to share the stories of and raise support for Filipino and Filipino American nurses. It is an honor for me to be able to represent The Justly Project and our collaboration with the Philippine Nurses Association of America at this 13th International Nursing Conference and Global Summit 4. The theme of this segment is nurses' stories. Here at the Justly Project, stories are at the heart of everything that we do. We capture and share the oral histories of Filipino and Filipino American nurses. By bringing their challenging and inspirational stories to the world, we aim to raise awareness for the importance of the Filipino diaspora and healthcare worldwide especially in this time of coronavirus pandemic, when Filipino nurses have sacrificed so much for the health of others. Ultimately, we also strive to use our oral history storytelling to empower Filipino leaders who can advocate for their communities and bring a diverse and resilient mindset to healthcare. In today's presentation, I'd like to tell you a little more about the Jesse Project and share with you some of our work documenting the oral histories of Filipino nurses and raising awareness and support for Filipino and Filipino American nursing communities. To do so, I will give you a glimpse of the origin of the Jesse Project, outline the Spark Justly Oral History Project, and discuss some of our most impactful initiatives. This panel will also feature guest remarks from nurse leaders in the United States. The Justly Project has its roots in 2019 in an oral history project that focused on the experiences of my grandmother, Lydia Espina, who survived World War II in the jungles of the Philippines, later trained as a nurse, and then immigrated to North America. This project culminated in a 50-minute oral history documentary titled Do Justly, Love Mercy, and Walk Humbly. The title of the film was inspired by the Bible verse Micah 6, 8, which Lydia chose as her motto for her 1958 graduation from the Brokenshire College of Nursing in Davao City. I think it captures not only my grandmother's caring and selfless attitude, but also the kindness and compassion of Filipino nurses around the world. The idea for the Jesley Project slowly grew around this documentary and reflected my conviction that capturing and sharing the stories of others through oral history could be a powerful vehicle for good. Oral histories allow us to build empathy and compassion and also provide us with valuable opportunity to learn from history. The Justly Project was born to make this vision come true. I'd now like to show you a very short clip from the documentary, Do Justly, Love Mercy, and Walk Humbly, in order to share what I found so inspiring about my grandmother's story. I'm in the Philippines. Working in the hospital is not like here. Here you have a lot of disposable things to use. There, we sharpen our uh, needles. We sterilize our own syringes and needles before we can use it for the patients. So it was hard work. And we made our own sponges, the, the bundles of uh, gauze that is received, we received from packages from the United States well, to cut them and make sponges to use for our patients. Did you enjoy the work of nursing? I loved it. It was, to me, it was just what I needed to do to, to really care for my patient. It was like doing something spiritual because I was a spiritual girl in elementary school and high school. My parents were. Then we always, as I told you, we always had prayers before having our meals and before um, at night sometimes my father would come and, and did a prayer. So that, that was really very uh, given to us very deeply, emphasized. All of us, nine of us, were really deeply spiritual, I would say. If you are intrigued by this excerpt, you can find the full documentary online for free at our website. My grandmother was born in the Philippines and trained as a nurse before immigrating to the United States and Canada. I have invited Dr. Gloria Bariones, Staff Development Coordinator at the Michael E. DeBakey Veterans Affairs Medical Center and President-elect of the PNAA, 
to reflect on her own experience immigrating to the United States and working in healthcare. I'm Gloria Lamela Berriones, the president elect of the Philippine Nurses Association of America. As a migrant Filipino nurse in the United States, it was my dream that became a reality. From the beginning and throughout my journey, I have had the purpose, passion, and perseverance. I learned to adapt, value lifelong learning, and commitment to contribute my knowledge, skills, and experience in providing excellent patient care. As we face this pandemic, a public health crisis, I encourage my fellow nurses and healthcare workers to really be the ambassadors of infection prevention control. Wearing the PPE when providing patient care, wearing the mask, the good hand washing, and social distancing. And to educate the public, the principles of infection prevention control and vaccination, get vaccinated to help stop the pandemic. Thank you. Dr. Barriones is a truly inspiring example of the powerful impact that Filipino American nurses have had on American healthcare. Of course, Filipino immigrants around the world bring their culture with them, along with their talents and compassion. One of my favorite parts about creating the Do Justly documentary was not just the opportunity to learn from my grandmother's story, but also the way that our shared conversations activated so many memories and allowed me to deepen my understanding of her life and my own Filipino heritage. We looked at photos of family together, made traditional Filipino foods such as pancit, and sang and played traditional Filipino songs. To honor Filipino history and tradition, I'd like to share with you now a few minutes of footage from the summer of 2019 of myself, my grandmother Lydia, and my Auntie Faye celebrating Filipino culture together. At the same time as I was finalizing the film in early 2020, the world was beginning to recognize the enormity of the COVID-19 pandemic and to appreciate the sacrifices made by the caregivers who were and remain on the front lines of caring for COVID-19 patients. Having heard my grandmother's own experiences as a nurse, 
I was moved by the challenges that the Filipino-American nursing community, in particular, has been facing in this moment of historic crisis. When I learned how Filipino-American nurses have experienced COVID-19 fatality rates disproportionately higher than the average rates among nurses in the United States, I reached out to the PNAA to see how the Jesse Project could help. Moved by the PNAA Spark program, stories of people, achievement, resilience, and kindness that had just been launched under the leadership of Dr. Mary Joy Garcia Dia, I was inspired to partner with the PNAA. Together, we launched a joint oral history project called Spark Justly, incorporating the Spark initiative of the PNAA. For Spark Justly, we interviewed dozens of Filipino American nurses in the PNAA to document their lives and careers. These interviews include urgent reflection on the COVID-19 pandemic, which again has disproportionately affected the Filipino-American nursing community, but also look beyond the crisis to set the work of these nurses in their greater life stories, and to explore themes such as immigration, education, mentorship, discrimination, resilience, and more. The full-length conversations have been deposited into the PNAA archive to form a permanent record and we have published hundreds of short clips from the Spark Jesse Conversations online, organized around vitally important topics such as nursing during COVID-19, diversity, education and immigration, and community and family. You can find these short clips on our docu-series page and our social media pages. So your mom was a nurse. Did that influence yes. your decision to become a nurse? Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, on my kindergarten, um, speech on graduation you know how you tell people what you want to be when you grow up with kindergarten and I said I want to be a nurse when I grow up I can uh -huh. remember that because I know I memorized that you know that one sentence that you have to say that's very sweet are there any other immediate um any other nurses in your immediate family I have several cousins who are nurses and that I think also influenced me because when I, um, they're a lot older than me, maybe 10, 15 years older than me. So when I was in the Philippines, they were already here in the United States, in New York, actually. And um, East Coast, majority of them were in the East Coast. So that really influenced me to be one of the influences for me to be a nurse. Actually, my mom is a nurse. Uh, my grandmother was the first nurse as you were telling me about your grandmother. That's what first came into my mind because she was the inspiration why we all became in the medical field, you know, with being nurses. Because she was the first nurse in her province of Bicol. Wow. And she died when she was 101 here in the United States. She came when she was 84. So she kind of like, told us her dreams and her uh, her aspirations for all her children and grandchildren. So in my family, there were, my mom was, was a nurse and my three sisters. So there's like a family of nurses in my own family only. Not, not including my cousins, there's more. <laughs> How was your experience going through nursing school? Like, did you enjoy it? You know, I loved it. So, so growing up, I actually grew up in Long Island and um, in Queens and Long Island. And for much of my childhood, um, I was either the only Asian kid in my class. And if I um, had other Filipinos in school, they were my family. And the same went for high school. And when I went to the College of Mount St. Vincent, that's where I found my, my Filipino um, schoolmates or that Filipino culture and wanted to just dig deep into it and even joined um, our, our Filipino group called uh, Samahan, you know, um, because when you were in nursing at College of Mount St. Vincent, I would say 75% of them were Filipinos. We even had a... Um, uh, a Corazon uh, Aquino scholarship designated to two Filipinos, um, a female and a male, and it would be a full four-year scholarship designated to them. Uh, so that's where I was able to kind of dig deep into the Filipino culture, um, you know, put on cultural shows uh, and learn more about the community and how we can kind of 
uh, serve as an outreach for others. Wow, so what's next? I have to go, I have to go to the US because there's so much recruitment. So since there was so much recruitment, uh, they started, uh, you know, like, like in the New York Times interview, I was in Manila one day and I had to go from one hotel to the next and to the next. And in one hotel, there would be like tons of recruiters. Uh, you know, it's like a fair of recruiters in the US. Uh, offering you all kinds of sign-on bonuses, uh, you know, sign-on bonuses, uh, free board and lodging, and all that type of thing. So, um, so I, I I look at every place, and JFK sounded so good because JFK is so popular, right? So JFK Medical Center, I picked that. Um, so in November of '88, I came over here. And, you know, I had to go, I had to, even though I would have been able to come earlier after passing in June, I had to finish the semester. The Philippine semester starts in June to October. So I, I had to make sure that I finished that semester so that I would not be leaving the university hanging dry. Um, I taught, finished in October and left. Came here in November 8th of 1988. What were the recruiters promising you? Oh, well, first of all, they were promising $10,000 bonus at the time. So I said, I wanted that, but they were looking for a clinical experience. So um, since I didn't have a clinical experience, they would rather put me in a nursing home if, I would, if they would give me the 10,000. I said, no, I'm not going to a nursing home. Uh, you know, nursing home connotation in the Philippines at the time is not, is not necessarily very, very um, alluring. Um, so I didn't take that. Um, so I, they offered me uh, that you would have three months uh, free board and lodging, free transportation. Uh, we would pick you up from your place, you know, from our uh, apartment. Uh, bring us to the hospital back and forth. They would bring us to um, to the post office. They would bring us to the mall, that type of thing. So, yeah, so I, I, I signed up for that because, again, John F. Kennedy Medical Center sounded so really good. So that, that's what I picked, even though I didn't sign up for the 10,000 because I didn't have clinical experience. Ellen, you mentioned some of the extraordinarily difficult and important work you were doing on the front lines. May I ask, how has COVID affected relationships between nurses and patients? Um, it's still, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, there's, there's an obstacle in there um, because you don't want to risk exposing yourself too long but also what I thought was, and this is kind of just my opinion, is that a lot of, there's, there's a lot of moral distress happening among nurses um, because you have to choose. And, you know, in a non-COVID times, you, don't, you never choose to leave, um, but to stay at the bedside and, ex and risk exposing yourself was a lot. And nurses were, were innovative enough to find ways to connect with their patients, whether it is hand signing, double gloved holding, um, they stayed. Uh, it's, it's, the, the caring never left. It's just the circumstances of caring was what the obstacle and created that distress among people. Like, you know, you choose who do you go to, uh, and that's 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 unfortunate, and that it's I think one of the gut wrenching things that I I experienced was like who like which hand do you hold? Do you like do like the both arms out or like because most nurses want to give that attention to that one patient at a time, and you couldn't, and then that's where the issue to me was but they did what they needed to do to reassure the patient. And 
I applaud for them for that because that's not a that's not an easy task to stay there and say you're fine. You know, the last day of my shift, the, my, one of the patients that was there for three weeks was extubated, and the the joy that the nurses had when that patient was extubated and know that she was fine and was there to like say yes you're okay let's turn on a tv for you what do you want to do like they try to make sure that she was comfortable to the point where it's like they were there for an hour making sure that she, and the, when they, she was extubated the first thing they did was clean her up and made sure that they were ready for facetiming the family members and i was like yes i was like I could, I could, do you want me to hold the iPad? I can, like, you have other things to do. I'll do it. Um, but like, no, 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 we'll do it. And I'm like, that's okay. If I'm here, I could hold the iPad while the family members talk to the family. Um, but they, as soon as that things happen, they will call the family and say, Hey, this is the update. This is what's happening without being told that, or the family member, um, the, the family never had to like say, have to keep calling because they called the family first and told them this is what's happening to your family member and I was like that was kind of you know most people's like oh no you make time and no they made sure that the family members were were informed in the beginning and at the end um, so they can do their day their their shift in between I know that you have been challenged as well um, with what's going on around us now and your retirement probably was such a blessing, but at the same time did not really um, prevent you from experiencing COVID. So what, what are your thoughts on what's going on around with COVID um, right now? I think right now is very challenging when COVID first happened. I didn't know what to do. I kind of felt, let me dry my eyes. <laughs> um, when COVID first happened, um, I'm retired already. So in a way it's a blessing, but in a way you feel guilty because you're not there. So one of the things I'm the kind of person who don't want to be playing victim. I like to be part of the solution. So part of what I did, I um, first I I got me a um, sewing machine and so so bunch of uh, masks. And then after that, I realized um, I gotta do more. And that's when Mary Joy asked me if I would be her executive director. And I realized in my, you know, later on, this is not something new that you can, you don't necessarily have to provide direct care. You can provide, uh, you can help by in the background, like helping PNAA with their advocacy for the Filipino nurses in this time of pandemic. That is very important to me. So that's how I'm doing my contribution. Thank you, Carmina, and we appreciate you, of course. And um, how are you doing so far with uh, your family? How are they coping with COVID? Yeah, COVID sucks. In the last 30 days, my husband lost his mother. And then two days ago, his brother. And then um, now PNA Virginia is going through some grieving because one of our past president is critically sick. She's intubated and we anticipate that she might not make it. So we can't wait for this, <laughs> I can't wait for this uh, pandemic to be over, it's no joke. Video to know about COVID. I think we need to follow the science, listen to the specialist. We need to mask up, socially distance, and take our vaccination. That's the only way we can um, fight the COVID virus. And the worrisome part is we're running out of time because the virus is mutating.
it is more easily trans it is more easily transmissible and so and we're behind in term in the rollout of the vaccine which really complicates our uh the health of everyone if you could tell the world one thing about filipino nurses um and their contributions to healthcare and society what would that be uh um it's a difficult question. Yeah. Uh, sacrifices without tears. They did a lot of sacrificing. Um, there was a lot of teary nights. So, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, they sacrificed their homeland, they sacrificed their comforts of their home, they sacrificed, um, they took risk um, to come here. And that is not without happy, bad days, um, but you know, those sacrifices are um, shown in how healthcare has, has grown and how has healthcare has changed. Um, because I think nurses, Filipino nurses are kind of the backbone in, of nursing a little bit in, in a sense, because there's always that one tita or one um, uh, mother hen, that's a nurse, the Filipino nurse, that's gonna tell you yes or no. Even the doctors know who the, the one nurse is, the one Filipino nurse that they need to go to to get their advice from. I'd now like to invite Dr. Mary Joy Garcia Dia, Program Director of Nursing Informatics at New York Presbyterian Hospital, President of the PNAA, and co interviewer of the Spark Justly Initiative, to share her own reaction to the impact of Season 1. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Grace, for that question. So, even prior to the pandemic, my theme was focused on Spark, which stands for Stories of People, Achievement, Resilience, and Kindness. When we met virtually, I have no idea that what I originally conceived as simply encouraging nurses to share their stories will have a powerful impact in our organization. There are actually three takeaways that I learned on this journey. The first one is that stories build empathy. As I listened to the nurses, I was able to appreciate the values of caring, kindness, and compassion. Each of them have a unique memory of how a patient had an impact on their nursing career. They gave me a glimpse of their values, their personal experiences, and their strength in overcoming barriers in trying to belong in another country. Of course, the most powerful story that, that we learned during our interview is their own struggle during the height of the pandemic with the shortages of PPE, the burnout and the fatigue that everyone has experienced, and of course, the short staffing and fearing for their own safety as well as their family. This really put everything into context in trying to just listen and allow them to um, share what that means from their point of view. Second is the importance of data. We know that data is everywhere. And we have to own our data in today's digitized world. These stories gave shape to raw data. And it's important for us to own that narrative, especially when there is so much misinformation going on in the internet. I am I'm very excited that we were able to have over 55,000 impressions and 1,500 likes and 700 shares. Uh, being an informaticist, this um, analytical tools that we can um, utilize in the back end allows us to really understand what that engagement means. How many shares, how many likes, how many reactions, how many emojis of um, sharing love, um, sharing those um, um, applause. That means a lot to people when they're seeing this right through social media. So as a result of these short clips, I was able to present 
um, this information during our International Council of Nurses Conference in November. And really, that's the third takeaway that I have. But these stories um, have recurring themes that emerged um, out of the um, analysis that we have. Um, it focused on diversity, the importance of mentorship, and really guiding each other to become good stewards and leaders. It also allowed us to appreciate the value of uh, our community uh, coming together and supporting each other and also the importance of mentorship. So there is really a lot of room for research in trying to understand how we can continue to empower and engage with each other. And of course, there is the um, history that comes along with it. And I think this is the most important takeaway. I have never thought that we will be able to include this as part of our opening during our gallery um, event recently in December. Uh, through the efforts of our archive committee, we were able to showcase the work of the Justly Project. And I learned how to become a better historian uh, just by working with Ren Kapukau. And I appreciate that you, Elizabeth Grace, ventured in sharing your grandmother's story. Because really, these stories will create a brighter future for our profession. Thus, I'm hoping that the PNAA frontliner story who faced COVID-19 during the height of the pandemic will engage and share their stories, will inspire each other in appreciating the courage and the compassion, and also help us to stay resilient and strong in leading our organization. So thank you for that question. The Justly Project is proud of the success that we have had in partnering with the PNAA to share the stories of Filipino American nurses and to raise philanthropic support for our community. To date, season one of Spark Justly has garnered over 55,000 impressions, 1,500 likes, and over 700 shares. We hope that the Spark Justly footage will not only create a permanent record of the Filipino American community's sacrifices during the COVID-19 pandemic, but will continue to inspire people to recognize the far-reaching contributions of Filipino nurses to American healthcare and to contribute to efforts to meet some of the greatest challenges that this community faces. We have not only helped share the oral histories of these healthcare heroes, however, we have also sought to fundraise for initiatives that would heal and give back to the Filipino American nursing community. Throughout 2020 and 2021, the Jesse Project raised over $50,000 for several initiatives supported by the PNAA and also spearheaded a giving back campaign. For this, we delivered $10 and $100 gift cards to Filipino American nurses to recognize them for their hard work on behalf of all of us. I would now like to turn to the major event of today's panel, the international debut of season two of Spark Justly. After an incredibly successful season one, which ran from January to July and produced over 200 clips from over a dozen interviews with Filipino American nurses, Spark Justly went into production for season two this September. Throughout the fall and winter, we have been and will continue to interview Filipino nurses to record their oral histories and share their perspective on important and timely issues from COVID-19 and diversity to nursing education, immigration, and diversity and inclusion. This time, we have expanded our reach abroad to focus on Filipino nurses working in international contexts around the world, from Saudi Arabia to Canada to New Zealand to Australia and more. This international perspective has immeasurably enriched the Spark Jealousy Project and shed light on the different experiences of nurses in the global Filipino diaspora. I'd like to share with you some of the highlights now. Eight years. But then the, the calling to serve our country really got into my heart. And so that's in 1995, I decided to join the army. And it was um, from there, it was actually, it's been a great experience for me to be in the army. It's so much different from working in a civilian hospital because 
it's not just being able to work in the hospital setting. I, I love the challenges of physical fitness and I love going into deployments, into the going into field hospitals and really experience the austere environment. It's, it's kind of weird in a sense, right? But the experience that I gained being a military nurse is so much more positive than, you know, you hear horror stories from other people. But, you know, there, there are a lot of, it, it's, a, you know, being in the, in the military, being in a de deployment setting is dangerous. However, there is some kind of, like, passion that I, you know, I sense when, when I was wearing the uniform that being able to serve, serve our country and being able to take care of our service members and at the same time being able to take care of other people from all over the nation. I had an opportunity to deploy in uh, different parts of the world. I spent a year in Afghanistan. I spent a few months in Pakistan. I also deployed in Angola, Africa. And I also spent a few months in Ukraine and of course in Bosnia. So all these experiences that I gained as a military nurse really, really is something that I will cherish throughout my, my, my life. And I am passionate about this and I'm always, it, it excites me whenever I, I talk about this with, with other people. So I spent 23 years in the military. I move around every two to three years to different stations and my final destination was in Hawaii, where, where in uh, 2015, I was offered a job to be, at first to be the chief nurse of the hospital at Tripler Army Medical Center. And then we restructured and I became uh, the, one of the deputy commanders, which is similar to a vice president position of a, a medical center in a civilian hospital. And I was in charge of all the inpatient sections, inpatient services. And I did that for three years. When it was time for me to move again, I decided to, to um, drop my retirement because I really love being in Hawaii. To be in a tropical island similar to the Philippines is really, it, it's really awesome. It's really paradise. So I decided to, to retire in 2018. So in a nutshell, my nursing career has been really exciting, lots of experiences, great experiences, and opportunities that open up more doors for me? Not really much, actually. Um, as far as I remember, I came into here in New Zealand when I was studying IELTS for my NCLEX exam. Someone came to our review center and, um, you know, introduced New Zealand. Out of nowhere, I just decided to attend that seminar. And from then on, you know, the process started and here I am. <laughs> did, did you leave uh, the Philippines with a cohort of other nurses or was it just you, I guess, sort just of by me. yourself? Just you. Yeah. How was that like being in New Zealand, I guess? Did, you didn't have family there, right? Or, or friends? No, it's, it's just me, actually. Um, probably, how do I say it? Um, I was really determined to go to get out of, you know, to, to, to have to do something out of my career. Um, how should I say it? Um, probably brave enough to, to go to a certain place without any idea what it is. Um, I've been, I mean, I, somehow I traveled to the U.S., but I have my family there. But here in New Zealand, arriving here and, you know, coordinating with people whom I'll be staying with, it's just a, probably a luck and um, determination that everything will be okay. <laughs> what were the challenges of moving to a country all on your own? Did you feel homesick? Definitely, yes. Uh, very thankful with technology because somehow I can connect with my family. But um, the challenges is, yeah, I'm on my own. I have, to, I have to be on guard with whom I deal with. That's what my family, my mom would always advise me. Uh, don't trust anyone right away. You have to make sure that um, you, you deal with people you know that has good intentions. 
um, one challenges I experienced and when I was hospitalized here um, and I have no one, no one to rely on. My aunt and my mom overseas would just call me and ask me, have you been housed? I um, mean, how, how are I am? And um, they were really even to a point that they want to visit me. But since, you know, um, time is the essence, they weren't able to do that. Uh, but luckily, I have, I've gained friends here who somehow I consider it as a family as well. So, yeah. What would you say are the main differences between New Zealand and the Philippines? Or would you um, say that they're similar? Yes, a lot. Um, although they're very warm, warm people, similar to Filipinos. But the on a good side, nature-wise, New Zealand has a very, you know, nice scenery. Plus their their love to their nature, they they respect nature. Um, how do I say it? Um, they really, um, um, nature is very important to them. Difference with, with, with Philippines, <laughs> very calm, very quiet. As far, I mean, if um, Philippines is somehow, imagine the population, I think more than 100 millions compared to New Zealand, which is where only 5 million. What about um, how was nursing, adjusting to nursing in New Zealand versus the Philippines? Similar, different? Um, facility wise, I think Philippines has, you know, um, big hospitals and everything. Probably because New Zealand has a small population. We do have a, a big hospitals here. Um, facility is okay. Um, the difference, probably the staffing, I would notice. I haven't worked in a hospital setting, but we're quite aware the staffing wise in, in the Philippines, in a public hospital there compared here, the, the ratio of it. But my first job in the hospital in the med surge, uh, that's different because I did have a uh, charge nurse and she was Filipino and she showed me the ropes and really took care of me and making sure. And I was always also, since I didn't have a lot of experience of work, I was always the first one to volunteer. Okay, if you have IV, can I do it? Or if you have a Foley insertion, can I do it? Because I've never had that. So I wanted to learn it. But she was very patient. She was only a year ahead of me, but she, was, she had a lot of experience already. She started in Florida and she came here through a... Um, uh, agency. So uh, yeah, she was from University of Santo Tomas. And so she, she had a lot of experience already. So she showed me around um, and definitely uh, taught me a lot. So I'm, I'm curious when you um, compare the um, nursing practice between the Philippines, the um, Arab Emirates, and now the United States, what what are the um, things that you could look back to in terms of your education that prepared you to adapt or adjust in all these three different uh, environments? Our education in the Philippines actually is very, very good because it is very structured. And once you graduate from nursing, it's like you have the uh, confidence that you know what you are doing because not only we we have the, the um, uh, classes, but we have the experience to go with it. So it's, it balances it out and it, it prepares us as well. In United Arab Emirates, remember that is 1981, uh, 1983, they are just starting. So it's kind of, we are the one who's opening the hospitals. We are the one who's um, like set the structure or set the, what are the things to be done like, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a thing, uh, like you, you are starting your own thing. You are starting your own policy, the procedures, you are like kind of um, incorporating what you have learned to what is available there. And you have to, to make it work. 
Well, one, one of the things that, you know, we're really um, promoting, you know, um, in the program that I'm leading is giving nurses a voice and, you know, exactly just that. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, just related to COVID, you know, just in your day to day practice. Um, you know, especially in many countries, I think the U.S. is actually a little bit more advanced because, you know, our nurses here feel empowered, but there's still so many countries where it's very medically driven that nurses are still very subservient. You know, they just, um, you know, follow whatever instructions are given to them. So that's something, you know, that, it, that we are trying to change um, culturally uh, around the globe. I hope that you all enjoy the international premiere of Spark Justly Season 2. I would now like to invite Dr. Joyce Fitzpatrick, Elizabeth Brooks Ford Professor of Nursing and Distinguished University Professor at Case Western University to share her perspective on the importance of international nursing narratives and oral history. I'm pleased to be with you today to share with you the value of narrative nursing or storytelling to empower nurses at the point of care to capture their passion and their commitment to their patients and to the nursing profession. Thanks to Elizabeth Grace and to Mary Joy Garcia Dia, you have heard about the storytelling through PNAA. Mary Joy and Elizabeth Grace have captured the stories of nurses Filipino American nurses and Filipino nurses in other countries caring for patients, families, and the communities in the most difficult times. Many of the stories that have been captured have been stories during the COVID-19 pandemic when we know that Filipino nurses have been on the front lines but nurses are doing now what they have done throughout the profession and throughout the world. The stories of nurses during the pandemic are no different than stories of nursing during the Crimean War when Florence Nightingale cared for the soldiers who were injured. She knew, she knew very well that she could make a difference just as nurses everywhere today know that they make a difference in the care of patients 24 hours a day in every hospital and every community. We started the Narrative Nursing Project about five years ago with a plan to capture the stories of nurses as leaders at the point of care and to share those stories with other nurses so as to empower nurses to really understand the difference that they make every day with every patient. We have captured stories of nurses around the US and we've shared those stories with other nurses to really help them to understand the power, the passion, and the persistence of nurses and nursing everywhere. Nurses make a difference, nurses save lives, and we know through these stories that it's an important profession and one that we are glad that PNAA is dedicated to helping advance and through the stories of Elizabeth Grace, through these stories captured by Elizabeth Grace and Dr. Garcia Dia and PNAA, and now other nurses everywhere. We will make a difference in the future of our profession. Thank you all for your dedication. We at the Justly Project are so excited as we look towards the future and anticipate even greater things in partnership with the PNAA as we strive to use oral history to support the Filipino American nursing community. We aim to be responsive to the monumental Future of Nursing report released in 2021 that charts a vision to support the well-being and health of nurses. We are looking forward to concentrating our efforts on the stories of nurses in the Filipino diaspora around the world and, in and ensuring that they are heard. Thank you again for allowing the Justly Project to share our oral history work with you at the International Convention. It has been a privilege to be able to support all of you and to bring recognition and support to your work. 
We look forward to more to come.